Let's just remain standing just a moment for prayer. As before we go to prayer, is there any uh, request you'd like to make known? But just raise up your hand. I'm sure he'll understand what's been in your hand. May God grant it. Let us bow our hearts now before him. Our Heavenly Father, we approach thee again tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus to give thanks and praise for all that we have seen and heard through the day and for our health and strength, for being alive and on earth and assembled here tonight in worship to thee. Now may the great Holy Ghost come among us tonight, Lord, and just work miracles and wonders. And we pray that you'll do for us like you did those at Emmaus that night, that when we leave here tonight, may we go home saying, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? Granted, Father, bless the reading of the word. And the text and the context, and the, we commit ourselves to Thee, Lord, with Thy Word. Use us as You see fit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you. We deem this a most grand privilege tonight to be assembled here with you again in prayer. We've had a wonderful day, and I get just a little hoarse. I preach all the time, and so I am kind of stay stirred up a little bit in the throat. But um, we had a grand meeting this morning at the fellowship, the businessman's fellowship meeting at Clifton's cafeteria. Had such a grand time. We always have it up there at Clifton's. It holds many memories for me. And I, uh, if that lady's here that paid for my breakfast this morning, <laughs> sister, I want to thank you. I didn't even know the woman. she come in and went around ahead of me, and she set some rhubarb over there so she knew I was a country boy. So she gave me some rhubarb, and then when I went out, the waitress said, uh, the cashier said, that lady just paid for your dinner I, or your breakfast. I didn't know who she was. And if she's here, I sure want to thank her. As we uh, have a great time there, Clifton's of a morning, and the Lord has did some great things. Brother Victor DeLuc, I I know I'm not pronouncing that right. LeDuc. That's where that prophecy came forth from Danny Henry. I got it in my Bible here, which was a great thing. When Danny Henry, I... Just come up to lay his arms around me to pray with me and at the service and he spoke in French and and the interpreter of the UN happened to be in the building and interpreted. It was just exactly the thing that I was seeking from God. And so many things. And I remember one thing, this is kind of for good for you sisters, you know. They, uh, I was standing waiting for Brother Argenbright, my precious brother and Full gospel businessman chapter there, and and uh, he was coming in, and I'd never seen any of this year new stuff that the women's wearing on her face. And I seen a woman come up there had green eyes and red all around and over her face, and I, I thought that poor woman. I looked back and I thought I, I'm a missionary, and I, I I've seen plaguery and I've seen leprosy. But I, I didn't know what was wrong with her. And I kept standing looking. I thought, you know, I, I believe i go over and tell the poor woman. I'm, I was going to go over and say, Sister, excuse me, I, I, I pray for the sick. If there's, if there's anything I can do to help you, let me know. And here come another woman up the same way. I said, it must be maybe they got some kind of a show on, you know, or something there. Uh, putting on clowns, you know, how they paint, you know, and look like that. And um, ordinarily, I wouldn't think a human being would want to disfigure themselves like that. And, uh, a pretty woman would want to look like that. And then they had that great big waterhead haircut, you know, that um, uh, kind of a, and it sure, uh, it was the awfulest looking 
But pretty girl stand there and mess her. Well, what it is, it's that first lady idea, you know. And you know, Jezebel was the first lady of yeah. Palestine one time, too, so be careful what you pattern yourself after, you see. Right. Don't try, and try to look like God said. Let your hair grow out. That's what God said, dude. Yeah. The day after meetings in Phoenix, is a little lady come up and said, Brother Branham, since the meeting, he said, I let my hair grow. I said, you're not far from the kingdom now. <laughs> she, she said, my sister had a wheelbar full of these shorts and things. She's going to throw them in the garbage can. And the next sister come along and got them. And I said, she said she was finished with those things. <laughs> so I said, that's all right. I believe the church will come back on its feet someday. If it keeps going like that, it'll get all right. I met a man not long ago. He said, why don't you leave off of those women? I said, well, I don't know. He said, people regard you as a prophet. I said, I'm not. He said, but they regard you that. Won't you teach them deep things, how to receive deep spiritual gifts? I said, how can I teach them algebra when they won't even know their ABCs? <laughs> you know what ABC stands for, don't you? Always believe Christ. And that's <laughs> That's the first ABCs. Let them learn how to do that, and then we teach something a little different, you know. And so when we get that, well, we're coming pretty close uh, to the kingdom. Now, it's been a great day. I had a great time here last night. Say, you know, did you try some of that toxin? <laughs> Amen. It's all right, isn't it? You know, Peter uh, told him how to be inoculated and... You know, they acted funny, but they sure was inoculated. <laughs> that was one thing. We used to, when we'd brand calves, you know, we'd take the branding iron and slap it on them like that, and my, you talk about bellering and hollering, but you know where he belonged after that. <laughs> that was one thing. <laughs> the way the Holy Spirit is, it might make you holler a little bit, but you know where you're at after that. <laughs> That's right. You're thoroughbred from then on. Anything I don't like is is a crossbreeding. I preached on that some time ago and always said one of the awfulest things is a mule. That fella don't know what Papa and Mama is. You don't know where he come from. I'm sure he's going nowhere because he, see, his Mama a horse and his Papa a donkey and, and he, he's a, that proves science when they think that man uh, kept uh, uh, getting greater in eating breeding and so forth from animal life coming up. Why, first time you cross the seed, it stops it right there. You ain't going to you. You can hybrid corn, but you can't plant that hybrid corn back again. It won't grow. So see, they, they just done found the same, condemn their own theory. So you cannot do that. So, but I, a mule, he's dumb. You know, you could just talk to him, and he'll wait all his life to get kicked before he dies. And he, you can tell him you can't teach him nothing. He's hard-headed. You can try to be gentle to him, and he'll stick his ears out, you know, and all oh, days of miracles just passed. Oh, there's no such a thing as that. You know, just bring. But a good thoroughbred pedigreed horse, you can just teach him anything. He knows who his pappy is, who his mammy is, who his great-grandfather and great-grandmother. He knows the history all the way back. And so is with a good pedigreed Christian that's born of the Holy Ghost. You don't have to say, I was Methodist, Baptist, and I had changed to Presbyterian Luther. He was born by the Holy Ghost into the family of God, and a pedigree runs plumb to Pentecost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. I like that inoculation. I was amazed at Sister Shakarian. Are you here, Sister Shakarian? Sister Dima Shakarian. This morning, she was telling in the meeting at the Phoenix, we was having the banquet, the dinner uh, banquet or whatever you call I get that all mixed up all the time. I, I used to have breakfast and dinner and supper. And now they got that dinner set up here for supper, and if I call that dinner, then what happens to my supper? I just can't, I can't get the thing straightened out somehow. And, and I, it's just breakfast, dinner, and supper at our house. So, and uh, that's all right. You know, you don't take the Lord's dinner, you take his supper, isn't that right? So, Lord, so we're right on that, brother, if we said amen to that. 
But we were having that banquet that night, and happened to be, you have no control of what the Holy Spirit's going to do. See, you don't control him, he controls you. See? When anybody goes in and says, now nah, you so and so, uh, you don't know what he's going to do. You just have to wait. Then I remember the Holy Spirit came down and, and on that discernment, it's just like dropping into a gear. And if the people don't realize it, but they are the one that's doing that. It's not me. It's their own faith. I might try to give just a short moment or two uh, exclamation of it. Try to explain it. You can't explain God because you've just got to believe God. If you can explain him, then you can no more accept it by faith. See, because you know all about it, you can explain it. But we accept God by faith. But you see, in Christ dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, he was God. We are a portion of that spirit. It was given to us by measure, him without measure. But if I took a spoonful of water or a cupful of water out of the ocean out here, it would be the same chemicals in that water would be in the entire ocean. So that's the way the Holy Spirit is when it's in us. It's not as great, but it, it's, in, um, it's uh, just the same spirit, does the same thing. Then you notice one time when our Lord, he said he did nothing until the Father showed him first. And he had a friend named Lazarus. And he, living with this friend, and the friend was going to get sick, so the Father must have called him away and gave him a vision to leave. He waited so many days, they sent for him, he never went. He just kept on going. Then at the appropriate time was that the Father had showed him to take for Lazarus to die, he said, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there, but I go waking. And um, so when he come to the Martha and them, we know the story. And then when he raised up this dead man, he never said nothing about being weak. That was God using his gift. But then a little woman pressed to a crowd and touched the border of his garment, and he turned around, not knowing who it was, he said, who touched me? And Peter rebuked him, said, Lord, in other words, he might have said this, why, that sounds very unusual for, for you to say that when everybody's touched. He said, but I perceive that I have gotten weak. And he looked all around till he found the woman and he told her that her blood issue, that her faith had saved her. Her faith, not his prayer, his faith, but her faith that was her touching God through him. That weakening, that was the woman using God's gift. But when God used his own gift, he never said nothing about it. See, being weak. Well, that's the same thing it is in meetings. It's people does that. If you don't believe it, it'll never work. It's your faith that does it. And therefore, that's what causes the things to happen in the audiences the way it does and that night, while we was at the banquet, the Holy Spirit began to move across the audience and talk to different people and tell them. And I noticed behind me, there was an elderly woman standing this way, just like looking into a television screen, watching it happen. Then just tell what you're looking at. It's just the same thing. As you're looking at something, it's like you was asleep and dreamed it, only you're not asleep. You're just looking at it. It's another dimension. And you go way back down what has been and way out what will be. That's God doing that. And then um, I noticed behind me, and it looked like it was coming from over in the corner, like where the lady is sitting there. And I looked back that way, and his sister's Shakarian. And I thought, that isn't her. And I looked back, and here was the lady standing here, and I seen a cataract moving over her eye. And I looked back again, and it wasn't... I knew it was too old for Sister Shakira and had no favorites at all. I thought if I'll speak to her, then the vision will come if she's praying for someone. And what it was, this famous heart specialist from the West Coast here, which is Brother Shakira's doctor, they had him there in the meeting. He's a Seventh-day Adventist by uh, religion, by denomination. And Mrs. Shakira 
was praying hard that something would take place, that the doctor would be able to be convinced that it was God, and he was her mother's doctor that had found this cataract covering over her eye. And there sat the doctor sitting along there, and Mrs. Shakaring over here at the where she was behind me, and there's no one else behind Mrs. Shakarian. And she was sitting there praying, Lord, let something happen. Now, while the discernment is going on, that'll convince this doctor that he might receive the Holy Ghost. He's such a great man. And so, um, he, um, it said, Mrs. Shakarian, you are praying for your mother. And a cataract is coming over her eye. And she's going blind. But said, I see a white mist moving from your mother now, going away. Thus saith the Lord, the cataract will leave. And she called her mother and told her the next day. Within a few days, every speck of the cataract was gone. Her mother was normal and well. And the doctor that examined the woman and found the cataract over her eyes, examined again, and the cataract was gone. So it was... So it goes to show that our God is still God. He just, and aren't we happy tonight to know that we have a heavenly Father who can move cataracts, move diseases, and He's just God, that's all. So we're going to speak to Him in a few moments before we read His Word. We've been talking the way we have. And then speak tonight. And now tomorrow afternoon is the service so all of our brethren and all of everybody can go back to their church. Now, in the morning, there are several churches here represented. This, my sponsorship of this meeting. Now, these men believes in this type of ministry or they wouldn't be sponsoring me and sitting here by me. And... Every visitor here that doesn't have their own church here, somewhere that they're attending, won't you find one of these brethren here, I guess they told where they were from, and tend their services in the morning. I'm sure they'll do you good. And it's my sincere desire that at somewhere between here and tomorrow afternoon, there will break out an old-fashioned revival of many churches here that will just be glorious and for this last day. We're trying to sow the seed that when the Holy Spirit does fall, it'll fall on the right thing. It'll bring forth the right kind of a crop as we're looking for the, these last days. And tomorrow afternoon is our closing service this year. And then we begin up at, I think it's called Santa Maria. Santa Maria. And then we go from there to Grass Valley and then, um, and then so on and on on up. So um, then, if the Lord willing, I'm to be in... Um, Brother Williams, are you here? He was a... He was Brother Williams. Uh, very, yeah, Brother Williams is trying. He said he had all Phoenix praying for me that instead of going over in Tanganyika, Kenya, and Uganda, and down through South Africa, this coming January, February, March, and April, he was going to pray that we'd be over Phoenix. <laughs> And, uh, Brother Carl, I, I'll just go the way he leads me. <laughs> you know, that the Lord bless you. Thank you very much for that sincerity. And I uh, hope now tomorrow afternoon that everyone comes out and we have a great rally tomorrow evening. I uh, try to preach a little if my voice is uh, able, and we're expecting a great time tomorrow. Now... I would like to read some uh, some of the precious word here. And I want you to turn, if you're keeping ta- a tab, as we call it in the South, of um, the text that we're reading, I would like, I've got some notes wrote down here, some scriptures I'd like to teach just a little bit tonight on a subject uh, found in St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. And let's begin with the 21st verse. St. Matthew 15 chapter and beginning with tw- verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre of Sidon. And behold, a woman of Cana came out of the same coast and 
cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she cried after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, and saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto her even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. If it would be called a text, I would like to take one word for a text. And that is the word perseverance. Perseverant, as Webster says, is to be persistent, persistent in making a goal to do something. To be perseverant is to persist. Before you can be persistent, you have to have uh, an idea of what you're being persistent about. And man, through all ages that's ever tried to achieve something has been persistent. Man, in order to be persistent, I might quote again, is to know what you are after. And if you do not know, you're not certain of your standing. But when you thoroughly understand what it is, what you're after, and are satisfied you're going to do it, then you can be persistent. Get really persistent. Holding on. I like the the approach. I like people that's persistent. When they are realized, no matter if the man is, is wrong, but yet he believes that he's right. But now when he gets to a place he's proven wrong, then to try to be pers- he cannot be persistent then because he's done proven wrong. But when he's is right, a man will hold on to it. I'm thinking of tonight of the great first president of this great nation that we so appreciate tonight, this great United States of America. George Washington, great man of faith, a man of prayer, a persistent man, very perseverant. And he knew what he was after. And one night, he prayed almost all night long when he seemed like the odds was against him. And he prayed till he said his body was almost wet all over from kneeling in the snow until he got an answer from God. And the next morning, with half of his army with not even shoes on their feet, them was American soldiers with no shoes on, their feet wrapped in rags. The Delaware froze over in ice gorges. He was persistent that he could cross the Delaware, for he'd heard from God. No matter what the opposition was, he had heard from God. Though three musket bullets went through his coat, nothing touched him. Why, he was persistent because he knew he was right, and his achievement that he was expecting was for the right thing. No matter what condition those men was in, how cold their feet was, he could be persistent because he knew he was trying to achieve something to help somebody else. And he had prayed till he'd heard from God. And he crossed the Delaware in the time of 
the ice flow. I might call your attention for a few minutes to another man that could be persistent. And anybody can when you know what you're talking about. When a person doesn't know what they're talking about, then they don't know which way to go. That's the reason I think that if Christianity and your eternal destination depends on your faith in God, you better know whether you're right or not. Noah, a great character, I like to speak of him for a few moments. He came from the lineage of Seth. If you notice, the lineage of, of Ham's children were all great masterpieces. They were scientists, great men, scholars, inventors, and great men that come through Cain. But through the other side came Seth's children were sheep herders, peasants, but real religious that served the Lord and believed on him. And one day while Noah, perhaps a farmer, out in the field, the world had got wicked like it is today to every intention of a man's heart was evil and it even grieved God that he ever made a man. And God spoke to this humble farmer and told him that he was going to destroy the world with water. Now it had never rained. Now what a message that was for a scientific age. And when they claim now that our science today will not compare with them of that day, they built pyramids. We couldn't do that today. We have no power to lift those rocks up there. And they had they could embalm a body that looks natural up to this day. We don't have that embalming secret that they did then to make mummy. Coloring and many things that they had then that we don't have now. And what a scientific age. Could you imagine a man going up there, taking his family and building an ark and saying that it's going to rain waters down out of the heaven when there had never been a drop of water fall from the sky? Could you imagine the the laughs and scoffs that came to that man in that day? How that the scientists would science would come and say, Looky here, we got an instrument we can shoot plum to the moon and stars. And there's not any water up there. Where is it coming from? How is it going to be there? Show me where it's at. The Word of God didn't stand up to their scientific quota. Neither does it today. But we believe it anyhow. And Noah was persistent, very perseverant. I can imagine him taking the doctors and bringing them before psychiatrists to find out what's the matter with the old man's mind. But it wasn't his mind. It was in his heart. And he had the word of the Lord. And he knew that it was God. And I can hear Noah say, If there is no water up there, and God said it was going to rain water from up there, God's able to put water up there. And his story held for 120 years. While he built away on the ark, very persistent in the time of scoffers, no one listened to him but laugh and make fun of him wherever he went. But still, he held right on because he knowed it was the word of the Lord. Yes. He was positive of it. I can imagine when his street meetings come off, how that they laughed. Oh, they were religious then, remember. Very religious. So was Cain. And um, he built an altar as much as Abel did. He, if, if religion is all God requires, he was cruel to condemn Cain because Cain done every religious act that Abel did. But he come in the wrong way. There is a way that seemeth right, but the end thereof is the death. But now you've got to be sure that you're right. So we just can't gamble on this. There's no need of doing it. Christ has left the, the 
pattern so plain till we, he said, even a fool shouldn't err. Yeah. You know whether it's right or not. And then when you're positive you're right, scripturally right, then you can stand there because and be very persistent with it. Now, Noah and his preaching, how that it must have been, someone said, that old man up there still hammered away on a boat. And they believed that any old boat would do if it did come a rain, whether it was God constructed or not. That's the way they think today. Any old church will do any old religious idea. Go join this. You don't like it. They don't like there. Go over to the next one, next one. Any of them do. But God's got a constructed Amen. church that's Amen. built on the rock Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. And all other grounds is sinking sand, said Eddie Brooke. And that's right. Upon this rock I'll build my church. The Catholic Church said it was up on Peter. He backslid after that. The Protestant said it's up on Jesus. I differ with you. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you. Then it was up on the rock of spiritual revelation of the Word. Amen. Right. Amen. Same thing Abel had. How it was revealed to him, instead of offering fruit like Cain did, he offered blood. For it was revealed to him, the whole church of God is built upon the spiritual revelation of Christ. Who he is, what he is, and all about him. And now, we find out that Noah stayed right with this subject. And I can imagine... God one day got enough of their laughing and scoffing at Noah. You know, God can just go stand so much. And then his patience runs out. So he got enough of it. And he was going to do something about it. And he said to Noah, go up there and you see the animals going in the ark. You go right in after all the animals is in and the door will close behind you. And that morning, the animals start coming in two by two. And I can imagine all the scoffers standing around saying, Now nah, go on up there and live with your stinking animals. <laughs> Get in there and shut the door with all the stink and so forth with those animals. That's the way they try to say it again today. But the man who knows what the ark is, no matter how much a ridiculing is done about it, how much it's condemned or all about it, the man knows that he's led by God. Yeah. Right. Amen. Noah marched into the ark, and God's great mighty hand closed the door behind him. Now, I can imagine that them seeing that, there were some people, might have kind of been a borderline believer, said, you know what? That old man could have been right. Just the kind of hangs around the meeting, you know, and comes to every meeting and said, the old man, could, but never willing to come in. Yeah. Right. Never willing to accept it. Then, like Hebrews 6 said, and like in the borderline believers of the Old Testament, just always watching and looking around and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Here come these people and stood around. Well, if it starts falling waters out of there, we'll go up and knock on the door. And that's a good-hearted old man. He'll open the door and let us in. So we'll stick around and find out if the rain comes. I can imagine Noah climbing through the first floor, went up the second floor, and went up to the third floor, come up to the Lutheran age, back to the Wesley age, and went to where the door was open, in the top, where the light was, into the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the upper room, up high, where the light come down. And of course, there's more light on the second floor than there would have been on the, on the first floor. And that's the way it's come, always. Now... We find out up there, I imagine Noah gathered his family around and said, Now, when day breaks in the morning, there will be darkness all over the skies. And there will be great rain falling. And the people will know then that I have prophesied the truth. 
But you know, after you have followed every instruction, now here's where I want you to look. After you followed every instruction, then if something happens that it doesn't come out right, many give up. Yes. That shows they did not believe what they professed they were saying. Yes. Amen. God tries his children. Now listen to the message. Noah, on the 17th day of February, according to the word of God, entered that ark. And the next morning, all of them was around expecting to see the rain start falling. But the sun come up, just exactly like it always did. Just a couple more hours, and it'll start, the rain will start. The day passed. I imagine Noah's heart began to flutter. I could say something right here, but I better not. But you notice, he couldn't get out if he wanted to. <laughs> he was sealed inside. <laughs> Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of your redemption. God sealed the door behind him. Amen. And Noah sat there. And the night went past. And the days of onlookers had come up and said, Well, uh, uh, sure, those scientists was right. That old man didn't know what he was talking about. It's not rain. And there the old fellow's in there locked up in that big old boat. Oh, what a great thing to be locked up with Christ. That's a, a realist. And the door was sealed behind him. He couldn't open it. Only the hand of God could open it. Now, and the second day passed. And the third day, fourth, fifth, sixth, till a complete week passed, Noah sat and sweated it out. Then, what lesson do we get from that? If God, what if Mrs. Shakarian would have said when the Holy Spirit spoke, Thus saith the Lord. There's a white mist going from her. The cataract will leave. And it never left for about two or three weeks. But she kept sitting there saying, It's got to be so. It has to be so. God lets you sweat it out. <laughs> but you must be persistent. Perseverant. No matter how you feel, what you think, or nothing about it, just hold on. Amen. If you really believe it, you will hold on. Amen. Stay right with your convictions. God promised it, and you feel it anchored in your heart. Stay there. Then on the last day of the week, Noah woke up that morning, I suppose. Clouds was all hanging around. They looked out through the upper window and it wasn't on the side of the ark God don't want him to look down this way he want him to look up that way so it was on top of the ark and as they began to look the clouds was hanging over lightning was a roaring and the people began to run up towards the ark the streets began to fill with great big drops of water the sewers all filled up while they thought they could pump it out of some overflow come but you see they got some boats out but if it wasn't God constructed, it sank. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing floated but the ark. And you know the ark was made out of shit and wood. And if you ever know what that was, it's lighter than balsam. It's nothing but just like a sponge. So light you could pick up a great big beam of it and hold it in one hand. And wouldn't it seem strange that God would construct his ark out of such a thing as that? And poured into this to fill up the pores and then it become harder than steel. And that's the way we have to do is empty out every creed, everything that's in us and every nonsense and every ungodly unbelief that the Holy Spirit might fill us and seal every pore of our believing, every pore of our mind. Until you won't notice whether it's your neighbor or who it is sitting around you, you're sealed into the kingdom of God. Then you can stand the benefit of the waves as you go through a persecution. Then the waters begin to climb up the hill. 
And the people began to scream and knock on the door, but Noah couldn't even hear them. He was sitting way up on top of the building, and they perished. Everything that breathed breath of air on the earth perished, with, and the very thing that killed the unbelieving world saved Noah. Yeah. That's the same as it is today. The stumbling block, the Holy Spirit that's making the world where they don't want it, the things that they are turning down is the very thing that will take the church up. The Holy Spirit will take the church in the rapture. Noah was persistent because he knew God had spoke to him no matter how long it took or how many years or whatever it was, he held on because he knew it was the program of God. Moses, the runaway prophet, with all the intellectual conception that anyone could have, he was so smart he could teach the Egyptians. And he tried to put over the program of God with his intellectual conception, and it did not work. And it won't work today. That's right. We are going at it in the wrong way, church and whole. We're trying to organize some kind of a program. You hear the, the revival's cooling off. It's down to just a smolder. What's the matter? It's because we got our, our man-made programs into it. All they're concerned about today is seems like is to adjoining church, bringing in new members, building some big building, supporting some radio program, or something like that. We've lost that interest, a really of souls, that soul travel that the Christian ought to have. We seem to lose it. I'm not talking about the real Christians. I'm talking about so many that profess to be Christians. Now, all you hear today is some big something and people going into expenses of millions of dollars for great things and then preaching that the Lord is coming in this generation while the, the sinner on the street knows you don't believe it yeah, or right. your, your, your action speaks louder than your words when, yeah. when you do that. Yeah. Certainly, we ought to be from house to house, from place to place, preaching and crying and begging and persuading, trying to get every soul in the kingdom of God we can. Sending missionaries east, west, north, and south and everything we can do to get the people saved. Now, we find today it's so much on decisions. You hear that all the time, making decisions. I want decisions are confessions. Confessions are stones. What good does it do to to pile up a bunch of stones if you haven't got a stone cutter there who can shape them in by the sharp two-edged sword of God into sons and daughters of God. Amen. Let them run around here with all kinds of women dressed like a skinned down wiener and call themselves Christians and man letting them do it and then calling themselves servants of Christ yeah. and the church in the lukewarm formal condition as it's in a form of godliness but denying the power thereof and Amen. calling decisions. Amen. We need stones cut into sons and daughters of Amen. God. Amen. Father, good does it do to roll up the stones if you're not going to have them cut. They've got to be cut and fit into the program of God by gifts and callings and placed into the church as they should be. Amen. Must be. Amen. Noah, Moses, and his intellectual conception failed just like the church and whole has today. The people go right on living. They come in, make a confession, put their name on. It's a letter. It's a letter. Bring your letter from here to there. It's not a letter. It's a birth. Amen. Get born again, and then you belong up there. Notice, but Noah, as persistent as he was, he had heard God. And one day this runaway prophet, back on the backside of the desert, he really come on them sacred sands to where every minister ought to come. No matter how many doctor's degree he's got, a professor of college, 
or whatever he may be, he has no business behind the pulpit until first he's caught on them sacred sands between him and God alone that he's got an experience with God that no scientist in the world could ever hammer away from him. They can take that word and cut it any way they want to. The devil uses the word. He proved it. He uses the word to cut his own program out. But when a man has once been back there on them sacred sands where nothing but you and God alone can stand, uh, all the scientists in the world couldn't take it away from you because you were there and you met God and you know what happened. Amen. Oh man, Jesus Amen. wouldn't let them preach until they went up to Jerusalem and would receive the Holy Ghost before they went preaching anymore. Amen. That's the experience. When Moses got that experience of that burning bush, persistent, while one little era, and he run out of Egypt. I noticed, out of the will of God, he went down there and killed one man, and it was held against him, and then God went down with him and killed the whole nation, and it was a glory. <laughs> that was a difference. Now, Moses, sometime when you meet God, it makes you act funny. You really do. Now, Moses was once, when he went out to deliver the children, he was a young warrior. And strong. But we find out when he got to be about 80 years old, his whiskers hanging way down and perhaps his bald head blistered nearly in the sun. And when he, the next morning after he had met God in this burning bush, we find him with Zephyr sitting straddle of a mule at their young and on her hip, leading this donkey with a crooked stick in his hand, the whiskers blowing, his eyes set just laughing and praising God. Somebody said, where are you going, Moses? I'm going down to Egypt to take over. <laughs> what was it? A one-man invasion. But what? He was persistent because he had met God. And no, God said, surely I'll be with you. And he did it. He took it over. <laughs> Why? He could be persistent because God said, I'll be with you. Make like any difference what the obstacle. When he got there, the first thing he met was somebody could try to impersonate the work that he was doing for God. Yeah. Same thing. That's what you always, you, as I've said the other night here at some other meeting, you always meet three classes. That's believers, make believers, and unbelievers. And so you find them everywhere. So here come these magicians up to try to impersonate with their supersension perception. And they told down these serpents to try to, or sticks to make them serpents. Moses had done all he could do. That's what God commissioned him to do, so he just stood still. Amen. Hallelujah! Yes. When you've done all you can do, then it's up to God to do the rest. Then Moses' serpent come around and eat up theirs. Now, you that believe in superstition perception, what happened to them sticks? <laughs> Amen. Amen! That's it. He was persistent. Little old David one day, the littlest and the most insignificant one standing there, Saul, the general, head and shoulders above all his army, great big fella, he challenged Goliath, or met his challenge, rather. Well, now, David, a little ruddy fella, little stooped shoulder with a, a little sheepskin vest on here, had a slingshot. But he was persistent that he could fight that giant. Yeah, yeah. What made the spunk in that little fellow? <laughs> he had something in him. Yeah. Yeah. I was going down in, I believe it was Georgia, somewhere down there, I was having, with Rufus Mosley and them, many of you knew him, and I was having a, a meeting down there in a football stadium, and I seen a little sign that always encouraged me. It said, it's not the size of the dog in the fight, but it's the size of the fight in the dog. <laughs> so that's the way it is. You don't have to have a PhD, LL, double LD, QST, whatever it is. Only thing you have to have is a good old Christian spunk with an understanding that God sent you. Bless the Lord. Like I was saying this morning, Hudson Taylor when a man told him, a young Chinese boy said, Mr. Taylor, I have just received Christ. It's burning in my heart. Now I'll have to have four years to get my, my B.A. and my doctor's degree and so forth. Mr. Taylor said, don't wait till the candle's half burnt.
before you try to show your light. Say, go do it now. I thought, amen. That's right. Don't wait around this, that, or other. Great big schools of theology. They're all right. There wasn't a day gone by. But brother, what we need today is not a school of theology. We need some lit candles. Listen, if you don't know no more about it, go tell them how it got lit. Let them light off of that and somebody let them light off of that. We'll have another return of Pentecost. Amen. Right. Just as soon as it's lit, if that's all you know about it, go tell somebody else how it got lit. Sometimes these cemetery or seminaries takes all, excuse me, takes all the light out of you. <laughs> that's right. Now, you're persistent. Just tell them how I got lit. Say, I was standing there and all at once the Holy Ghost fell on me. You'll do the same thing that happened to you. Tell that much. If that's all you know, just tell that. That's enough. David, he knew that God had helped him with that slingshot to kill a, a lion and a bear. And he seen the condition. And the Lord was speaking into his heart that he had given the victory over that giant. So he was persistent. His brother said, I know you're naughty. Go back over there and herd them sheep. But God had a commission, and David was persistent until he slew Goliath. Samson, with nothing but the jawbone of a mule. And did you ever study how big those armors was on those Philistines? Well, that helmet that went over their head, down over their ears, where they could knock the glance of a two-handed sword off. It was about an inch or inch and a half thick of brass down over their heads. And you know what an old rotten jawbone of a mule would be? The first lick on top of a skull, while one of them helmets would burst that old jawbone all to pieces. But David could feel back and feel them seven locks. That's all he had to feel. And the Holy Ghost come up on him and he beat a thousand of those Philistines down with that jawbone. Amen. He was persistent because he knew that them seven locks stood Amen. for our covenant and God was with him. He could be persistent. Yes, sir. John the Baptist. We don't have much record of him. We know his father was a priest. And they were old, both of them. Elizabeth and, and Zachariah were well stricken in age. Must have been kind of hard on the, the family because they know they wasn't going to live to see their son come into his ministry. But they know the promise was from God. They died, we we're told. In the stead of John going like his father did back to the same college and the same school and getting the Ph.D. and so forth and learning. He had a job to do, not kiss babies and marry the young and bury the dead. He had to hold a two-handed sword and be up the battlefront. And he couldn't afford to take any seminary experience. He couldn't wait for all that, learn all how to shuffle out all the creeds. If that's what he had to learn, that's all he could give to the people. But he went out there in the wilderness and stayed because he was to introduce the Messiah. So he stayed there till God told him what that Messiah would be. Amen. And if John Lord did that, how much more are we to study and see what the Holy Spirit's supposed to do in this day when he comes? How's it going to act? What's it going to be? The day when we're scrupled up with all kinds of dogmas and doctrines and injections and embalming fluid and everything else. And then we do that and then don't study. You just take it presuming. Presume is to adventure without actual authority. Don't presume upon God. Take His word for it. Amen. Go on. God's got the program laid out here. He foretold us by His prophets what would take place in this day. John stayed out there until God told him now. Now, of course, when he went out, he said, I am the forerunner. I'm he which is spoke up by the prophet Isaiah. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And now, um, no doubt, but what the, some district presbyter or some uh, campuses or bishop or somebody come by and say, you know, Bishop Jones over here, I just always thought he'd be Messiah. So, you know, I'm just sure that's the same mistake that the church made with his new keys. Jesus gave Peter the keys and the church had the keys. But what did they do the first time they used it? They chose Matthias to take the place of Judas and it didn't work. There's never nothing said about him, but God chose a little high-tempered, crooked-nosed, ill-tempered Jew. 
And he said, I'll make him over again and show what things he'll suffer for me. It's God has to do things, Amen. not man. So we find out that John could not afford to go down and get some seminary theological injection. So the thing he did was wait there and God told him, when you go out there now, you'll have this, that, that, but don't you pay no attention to it. That Messiah will have a sign of a Messiah. Amen. And you'll see it'll be a spirit of, will descend from heaven like a dove and it'll go up on him and that's a Messiah. And John was so persistent that he was going to come in his generation. He never built no big schools. He never had no great seminaries and invited people into them. What did he do? He was so sure that he said, There's one standing among you now. Yes. Amen. 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 Yes. You don't know him. But he's the one that will baptize with the Holy Ghost. Yes. I know he's here. Yes. Hallelujah. How we can say the same thing tonight by the signs of the Holy Ghost. We know that same Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost is here. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Same thing that God said it would do in these last days. Yes. Excuse me for not staying back here, but uh, if you felt like I did, you walked too. Yes. So they, um, John was sure, and he knew what that sign of Messiah would be, so he, he absolutely was persistent that he didn't know him. One day he come walking down among them, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He said, He that told me in the wilderness to baptize the water, said, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining, he's the one that will baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now, long ways to get to my subject. But this little woman that we read about, she was a Greek. But she had heard of Jesus. And faith cometh by what? Hearing. Hearing the Word of God. Now, she was a Greek of another nation. Now, but you know, though she wasn't in the belief of that, she was of a different race of people, yet, you know, faith finds a source that others don't see. Faith finds a source that others doesn't see. And her faith had found that source. Now, she knew that it... By hearing, if she'd have got there, what was going to happen? The Word of God, according to Hebrews, the fourth chapter and the twelfth verse, is sharper than a two-edged sword. We know that. And faith is what holds that sword. Amen. There's nothing else can hold the sword of the Bible but faith in God. Amen. That yields it. Now, you might be weak with your arm of faith. Maybe you can just cut out justification. Maybe you can just cut out enough to join the church. But a good, strong arm of faith can cut through to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It can cut through to divine healing. It can cut through to gifts, miracles, signs, wonders. It can cut every promise of God out of the skies and claim it. Because it's yielding the Word of God. She had many hindrances. If you'd happen to go to thinking about it, but her faith didn't have any that's it. If your faith don't have any hindrances, it's different. She had, but her faith had no hindrances. Faith doesn't know no hindrance. Faith only knows one thing. It's gold. That's all. Someone might have said to her, now wait a minute. You are a Greek. You have no business. You're a Methodist. You oughtn't to go over to the Pentecostals. You're a Baptist. You shouldn't go there, see. But that didn't hinder her. She was persistent. She was very perseverant. And then there might have been another group come up to her and said, Now, wait a minute here, darling. You know what? The days of miracles is past. But that didn't stop her. Why? Faith had took a hold and she was still persistent. She was going anyhow. And then there's another group. Some of the women of her church might have come around and said, Dear, do you know what? If you go over there, your husband is a deacon over here, he'll leave you. That's all. There'll be a divorce in your family. But faith had caught a hold of something, the Word of God, and she went anyhow. Amen. She was persevering. 
She wasn't going to take no for an answer. Faith had caught a hold of something. I wish she would do that tonight. Every person here. Faith, take a hold. It knows nothing but truth. It's all. Now, well, there might have been another group that come up and said, you'll be laughed at, you'll be called Holy Roller. If you ever go over there, you'll be branded one of them. But you know what? She was still persistent. She was going regardless of what she was called. Faith had took a hold. Now, there, here might have come up a bunch of preachers to her of her own faith and said, you know, or, or the faith that her people belong to, and would said, you know what? If you go, you'll be put out of your church. But still she was persistent. She was going to get there anyhow, regardless of what anybody said. She wanted to get there. Finally, she arrived, like Noah. She arrived. But when she arrived at Jesus, she thought all was finished then. And many times people think because that God blesses you, gives you a fine meeting, or gives you a big stir of faith right quick, the Lord speak to you, call you out of the meeting, you think, oh, that's just it. But remember, there's some disappointments there too. God tries every child that comes to him, every son. So when she got to Jesus, she thought, all be over, you know, when she got to Jesus. But quickly he turned with a great disappointment and said, I'm not sent to your race. Now, actually, she should had to pass through every one of these barricades, and she had hurdled them every one by her faith, and she got to this Jesus of Nazareth, and as soon as she got there and went to cry and after him, he ignored her, walked away, and then finally he turned around with a rebuke and said, I'm not sent to your race. I'm just sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. What a rebuke. If that had been some of our Pentecostal people, they'd said, well, if that's the way he feels about it. <laughs> and then besides that, she said, she recognized. And he said another thing. He said her race was a bunch of dogs. Oh, my. The very audacity. Wouldn't that a shuck of Pentecostal? Bless God, I'll go to the assemblies now or over to the Church of God or the Four Square. If you don't, I'll leave the whole bunch and go to Baptist. If they won't have me, I'll go to Presbyterian. I finally wind up a Catholic, I suppose, see? Oh, sure. They won't call me such a thing as that. Say, I'm a dog. <laughs> yes, call her a dog. Said, I'm not sent to your race of people. I'm only sent to the Jews. I'm not sent to you. And besides, your people is just a bunch of dogs. Hmm. But still she held on. Oh. I like that. Now I feel religious. <laughs> Amen. I like that. No matter what the obstacle was, she still held to that faith. That's when you got a hold of it, brother. Amen. All the, everything in the world couldn't shake you away from it then. That's right. She held on, no matter what anyone else said. She held it. Even Jesus himself said, I'm not sent to your race and you're a bunch of dogs and I won't take the children's bread and throw it to you dogs. Oh, my. But she still held on. Hallelujah. I like that. She wasn't a hot bled, a hotbed plant, some kind of a hybrid like the modern crop is today. <laughs> what did I say then? <laughs> Notice. That's right. A hotbed plant has to be babied. You have to spray him all the time, pat him on the shoulder. But an old sturdy plant that come out out there by the power of nature. You don't have to spray him and no bugs going to bother him either. Amen. <laughs> this hybrid stuff. Have to pat him on the shoulder if the Methodists don't want him, the Baptists will take him. If this one don't want him, the other one will take him. That's the reason they have no faith. She was one of them hybrids. No, sir, a hotbed plant. She knew what she was after, and she had a hold of something that was going to deliver it for her. Amen. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. I like that. Yes. yes, sir. She wasn't a modern crop that we, we have today. She stayed with it. Notice, she also admitted that what Jesus said was the truth. Yes. Ah. I am a dog. <laughs> Amen. Faith, listen. Jesus was the Word. Yeah. 
And if you've got genuine faith, a faith will always admit the word is right. Faith will never argue against the word. Amen. It'll stay with the word. The way the word said do it, that's the way faith will recognize it. Let's go let that soak a minute. (laughs) Yes, faith admits the truth. She said it's truth. She admitted he was right. Faith will always do it. See, she had a hold of something higher than the whole Jewish generation did then. She had something that she'd got a hold of that was wouldn't turn loose. There was something uh, impulsing in her that she knew she was going to get her request. No matter if she was to be called dog, she was to be called anything, kicked out, run over, whatever it was, she had a hold of something that she knew was going to deliver her request. Yes. Ooh, God have mercy on this sinful generation of people. Hallelujah. Take a hold. If that be God's word, every word of it is the truth. Amen. 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 And the Holy Spirit faith will punctuate every promise with an amen. 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 She held on to it. She said, it's a truth, Lord. I'm not worthy. I'm a Greek. I'm not of your people. And I'm a dog. And I'm not coming for you to baby me and have to lay hands on me like Naaman or some of them. Surely he would have come out and laid his hands on me, stroked away the leprosy. The prophet said, go dip in the Jordan. Oh, my. See, that's the reason people miss it. They want to get it the way they want it. God gives it the way he wants to get it. We want got one set way. We must go that way. That's all. But God does it his way. She said, it's truth, Lord. I'm not worthy. And I am a dog. You just call me one. But the dogs eat the scraps that falls from the master's table. She was willing to take scraps. How much different are those Pentecostal people? You know what's the matter with us Pentecostal people? We've seen so much until it's become common to us. We've been so blessed. That's what's the matter with us Americans. When I go to India and see them little babies laying there and their little bellies swelled up from hunger and a mother laying on the street dying. And the places like that to see hunger and starvation come here and see enough raked off in garbage cans to feed them. See these women go out and pay $8 for an afternoon lunch, something like that, and nibble over a few minutes and talk some society of some sort and dump it out in a garbage can. That would feed some hungry Korean children. And then we call ourselves a Christian nation. We're fed well. The Pentecostal people go around and they go back and they go through to see oil robbers type of meeting, what God does with oil, come back and sees this other one and this other one and this other one, all God working. Then first thing you know, they just sit back and just take it common. Like an old salt one time coming from the sea and he met a poet, an English poet. And he said to the poet, the poet had wrote many poems about the sea. And the old salt said, where goest thou, my good man? He said, oh, I'm going to the sea. I have never seen it, yet I have wrote of it from what I've learned of books. He said, but I've never actually seen the sea. I long to smell the salty, briny waves. I like to see the blue sky reflecting in its blue waters. I long to hear the scream of the seagull. And the old salt standing there with a big pipe in his mouth spit and said, Oh, I've lived on it for 50 years and I don't see nothing so thrilling about it. Why? He had seen it so much until he was, it became common to him. Yeah. And that's the way the people, they see in this last days when the Bible speaks exactly what the Holy Spirit and what Christ will do at the appearing just before the coming. Yeah, and they see the thing taking place and say, well, pretty good. I guess that's all right. Oh, my. It ought to shake our hearts. Yeah. It ought to make us persistent yeah. to try to get the yeah. message to the people yeah. before it's too late. Lord, I'm wanting only crumbs. Remember, she had never seen a miracle. She was a Greek, but she had heard that there was a miracle. 
that Jesus performed miracles, and she knows if he could perform miracles for one person, God was a creator of all things and all people, and he could do it for her. She never seen a miracle, but yet she was believing for one. And we see him day after day and night after night. She had never seen him. She was like Rahab the harlot, one of the spies. Come over. She never said, now, wait a minute. Let me go see Joshua. Let me see how he wears his clothes. Let me see how he combs his hair. Let me see him do some miracles. She never asked for that. No, that's the reason she was justified. Because she accepted it by faith. She said, I have heard. (laughs) Amen. Amen. I want that God to be my God. She heard. And when she heard, it was God moving. And she knew it was God because she had seen the sign of a God that could conquer all the king's powers in the world. She was ready to receive it. Yes. Oh, my. Watch what that did to Jesus. He said, for this thing, for this thing. See, she had the right approach to God's gift. You've got to approach it right. When you're sitting out there, when you're in church, when you're at the altar, wherever you are, you've got to approach God in the right manner. Favor, faith always admits the truth. Martha. Let's speak of her just a few minutes. Martha, we always think she is so dilatory about getting her house clean when she's going to entertain Jesus. Mary, a little lazy side, just sat around and listened. Jesus, of course, said she listened to the better things, but Martha showed her color what she was. What was in her heart? She knew that Jesus was the Son of God. No doubt she'd read many Bible stories. She'd read about the Shunammite woman and how the woman has passed the age of bearing. And she had made a little chamber for the prophet because she said to her husband, I perceive that that's a holy man that passes by our way. Let us, I pray thee, make a little chamber on the side of her house that he might be able to rest. And if we're not home, he can just go on in and have the key at the door. And she was showing kindness. And Elijah gave her a blessing and told her she'd have a son. When that son got sick at about 12 years old, he must have had a son stroke. He cried, my head, my head. His father taking him in or had him took in, sat on his mother's lap until noon, and he died. Now look at the faith of that woman. She took him and laid him on the prophet's bed. Mm -hmm. What a place to put him. She laid him on that bed, and she said, saddle a mule now, and don't you stop until I tell you to stop. And so she took off to the mountain where she went to this cave where Elijah was. God don't tell his prophets everything, just what he wants them to know. And Elijah looked up and said to Gehazi, said, here comes that Shunammite. And I, she's full of sorrow. I don't know what it is. God's kept it for me. He said, is all well with thee? Is all well with thy husband? Is all well with the child? Look at that Shunammite woman. All is well. Amen. Amen. What? She was in the presence of a man, the agent of God, the man who could perform a miracle. To take a woman of her age past barren and an old, an old man like her husband and bless them in the name of the, the Lord God and see a vision and tell her she'd embrace a child. And she did it. She knew then that was a man of God. So she said, let me go to him. And when she got to him, she said, all is well. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. All is well. And then she began to reveal... And then Elijah, he told the Gehazi, said, take this staff. Because Elijah noted everything that he touched was blessed. Now, whether the woman would believe that or not, I don't know. I think that's where Paul, being fundamental, got the idea of laying handkerchiefs and aprons he took from his body on the people. And then Elijah said, take this staff, gird up thy loins. If anybody speaks to you, don't speak back. And go lay this upon the dead baby. But the woman's faith wasn't in the stick, it was in the prophet. The stick never told her so. The prophet told her so. And she was persistent. She said, as the Lord lives and your soul never dies, I'll not leave you. Amen. Oh, I like that. That's God of a people to take a hold of the Holy Ghost. God's ancient in the earth tonight and hold on to it like that. I'm not going to turn it loose. Amen. You might have to wrestle like Jacob all night, but you'll get your request. Hold on to it. 
be persistent. And she held on until she got her request. Maybe Martha had read that story. And she knew if God was in that prophet, that Jesus was the man of the hour then. And surely God was in his son if he's in his prophet. So she goes out to meet him. And when she met him, she could have abraded him now because she sent for him to come. Lazarus had been dead four days and was stinking. And she ran out to meet him. She heard he was coming. So she was persistent. She left the funeral procession and ran out to meet Jesus. Though he had done, turned her down, she went to meet him. She was persistent. And she, she ran up to him and she said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. I like that. Oh, yeah. See? Okay. Though he's dead, though he stinks, yet whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Praise now, that's the way to get something yeah. done. Amen. Now, that's the way you congregation ought to feel about your pastor. See? Yeah. That's when God will answer. Oh, that's right. Yeah. You've got to approach God's gifts in the right way with reverence. And ministry is minister of gifts. There are gifts in the body. Five spiritual gifts that predestinated and foreordained of God to the church. I know there's nine local gifts in the body, but these are God's office gifts. The office, apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, evangelists. And we must respect them if we expect something from God. She ran right up to him and she said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, Whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Although the doctor said this, but even now, Lord. The doctor says you got cancer, but even now, Lord. The doctor says you can't get well, but even now, Lord. That's it, even now. Yeah. Whatever you ask God. And he's sitting on the right hand of the majesty. Yeah. A high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Ever yeah. living to make any sense. Oh, my. Oh, bloody clothes laying before the altar of God. High priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Your faith can touch him. He can take an office in the church and speak right back to them lips and tell you exactly to do the same work he did when he was here on earth. And he's doing it. Amen. Amen. Why can't we be persistent? Certainly with such as that. Far more than she had. Notice. Now... Martha, she said, even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Look at that. Though he had turned her down and said, the only thing I want you to do is just ask prayer. Whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Listen to this, boy. The cogs begin to come together then. Faith begin to meet with God. It's just like putting a negative and positive together. You're going to get light pretty soon. Now you notice what happened. Now, he said, thy brother shall rise again. She said, yes, Lord. He'll rise again in the last day, the general resurrection. He's a good boy. He'll come forth. Then Jesus straightened up. See, things just begin to happen. Now she's sweating it out. Like Noah. And like this woman we're speaking about, this Greek. Sweating it out. He said, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believe a sound this? She said, Yea, Lord. <laughs> I believe that you are the Son of God that was to come into the earth. Right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that you are what you profess to be, yes. the Son of God. Something's got to happen. I believe that you are the Son of God that was to come into the world. A woman met me some years ago and was discussing that with me. She said to me, she said, Brother Bram, there's only one fault I find with your preaching. And I said, thank you. Just one fault. That's, that's very good. And she said, that is this. You brag too much about Jesus. And I said, oh, my, that's it. I, I'm so glad I do. I said, I can't brag enough. She said, but you see, uh, Mr. Branham, here's one thing. Her church doesn't believe he's divine. Just believe he's a prophet. If he's just a prophet, we're all lost. If he's anything short of God, we're all lost. That's right. Certainly. He was God. And she said, you make him divine. And he wasn't divine. I said, he was divine. Amen. She said, you claim you believe the Bible. I said, I do. And she said, if I'll prove by the Bible he wasn't divine, will you accept it? I said, the Bible said he wasn't divine. I will, but you can't prove it. She said, I'll do it. 
I said, all right. She said, in St. John the 11th chapter, the Bible said that when Jesus went to the grave of Lazarus, he wept. And if he was divine, he could not weep. I said, lady, your argument is thinner than the broth made out of a shadow of a chicken to starve to death. I said, you know what I mean? Oh, yes! Yes! I said, he was divine. I said, he was both God and man. Amen. Right. I said, he was a man when he was weeping. But when he stood by the side of that tomb where a dead man had been dead, four days and said, Lazarus, stand on your feet. Four days come back. Always. That was more than a man. Yes, he Sure was. He was a man when he came off the hill that night hungry, looking on a tree to find something to eat. He was a man when he was hungry, but when he could take five biscuits and two fish and fed five thousand, that was more than a man. Amen. Amen. That was Amen. 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 He was a man when he laid on the back of that ship that night. Virtue gone out of him, his lips cracked from preaching, his voice hoarse, coarse. He was laying on that ship asleep until 10,000 devils of the sea swore they'd drown him that night. When he had him laying on a pillow in the back of the boat and the waves of flashing back and forth, couldn't even wake him up. He was a man when he was asleep. He was a man when he was tired. But when they wakened him and he stood out there and put his foot up on the braille of the boat and looked up and said, Peace, be still. And the wind of the waves obeyed him. That was a... That was more than a man. Amen. Body that man. He was divine. He was more than a prophet. He was a God prophet. Hallelujah. Body man. Jehovah made flesh to take the sting out of death. Notice, he was a man when he cried for mercy on the cross. That's right. But on Easter morning, when he broke the seals of death, held in the grave and rose again. That I'm he that was dead and alive forevermore. That was more than a man. Everybody that's ever mounted to a hill of beans in this earth has been people who believe that. Even to the poets, one Amen. said, Living, he loved me, dying, he saved me, buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. Someday he's coming, oh, glorious day. Eddie Pruder wrote, the persecuted, wrote the inauguration song of his coming. He said, Oh, hail the power of Jesus. Name the angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him, Lord of all. Certainly, blind Fanny Crosby, what can you say about him? She said, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Yeah. Bear my humble cry. Yeah. All others are calling, do not pass me by. For thou the stream of all my comfort, more than life to me. Who have all on earth beside thee, or whom in heaven but thee? Yeah. 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 He was more than a man, he was God. Yes, sir. Martha was persistent until she got what she asked for. Here a few, about a year ago, one day I'd come in from the meetings, tired, I went out to speak to the little tabernacle. A woman may be sitting here tonight. If she is, I want her to raise up. She's from here in California somewhere. They'd brought her in. She had a tumor that was out like this. A tumor weighed 50 or 60 pounds. She was a terrible looking sight. Man had to pack her in. Usually at the tabernacle, I'm real tired. I don't pray for the sick. I just come in, speak to the church, and went back. If I'm not mistaken, some of the brethren are sitting here tonight, all the way from Jeffersonville to come down here, that helped pack the woman around. They said it went out through the back door. She was persistent. They told her, they said, Brother Brad, don't pray for the sick when he comes in. Like this, he's too tired. We don't call him. Wait a few days. She said, I can't. And so she got some of the deacons or trustees to pack her out the little back door. After he got through speaking, went out. She caught me by the leg. She held on, laid hands on her. In a few months from then, she pa- here she is. Is that you, sister? There she stands right now. Oh, the tumor dissolved. God healed the woman. When a bunch of men had to pack her out. What was it? Persistent. Perseverance. She believed. And she held on to it. That's what it takes. It takes something to be perseverant. Something to hold on to. It was Micah. Down there went Jehoshaphat and Ahab. 
What would a man of God want to make an alliance with a hypocrite like that? He got in wrong company, just like a lot of people do. Get out amongst unbelievers. Social gospel. Such stuff as that, and you get yourself messed up. Yeah. Jehoshaphat said we should go up to Ramoth Gilead. Well, sure, and naturally, oh, they went up, got 400 well-fed, trained prophets. They come up there, and they said, go up, the Lord's with you. And the guy went and got him some great big horns. He said, but this, you'll push him out, because why? Joshua divided the lands, and Ramoth Gilead belongs to us. It sounded fine. See, it sounded all logical, fundamental. Said you'll just push him plumb back out of the land. You know, but there's something in a church, uh, a man's heart that's a man of God. Jehoshaphat said, "Look at there, there's 400 of them, and all with one accord, giving one voice." Said, "I know that that's got to be right, Ahab." Said, "Now we're Jews. Jezebel on the throne with him." See, said, "Now look at there, 400 Jewish prophets saying, go up, thus saith the Lord.'" That didn't ring a bell. Jehoshaphat said, "Haven't you got one more?" One more? What I need but one more when we got the whole seminary here. Yeah. <laughs> now, Bishop and all, what do we leave with any more? Well, he said, isn't there one more? He said, yes, there is one more, but I hate him. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the officer said, said, not the king say that. Go get him. said, he's, uh, he's Micah, the son of England. said, but I hate him. He's always prophesying wrong against me. Always telling me something. Oh, yes, he's trimming the corns down, getting the warts off. See, yeah. uh, everybody wants to be babied and petted. That's the reason it makes hotbed plants. Yeah. Have to be sprayed with goody goody this and goody goody that. Christianity is rugged. Amen. The gospel is to be handed barehanded, not with ecclesiastical gloves on. Yeah. Right, soft white gloves that belongs to the women, not the preachers. Yeah. Uh, Listen, brother, the word's got to be handed just the way it's there. Not with some seminary dogma in it, but uh, just the way it's written here. So the, they sent the deacon board over and told him, said, Now look, Micah, we'll take you back into the association if you'll just say the same thing the bishop and all of them says. <laughs> He's talking to the wrong man there. <laughs> Micah knew what it was to trust God. He said, As the Lord God lives, I'll only say what he puts in my mouth. Oh, Amen. Amen. Seminary, no seminary. Cooperation, no cooperation. But I'll just say what God puts in my mouth. He took that night and went back the next day. He said, go on up. But I seen Israel scattered like sheep having a shepherd, no shepherd. And so this great big bishop smacked him in the mouth and said, which way did the Spirit of God go? And it went on me. He said, I saw God set in heaven. The council was hell. And I saw an evil spirit come up, a lying spirit. He said, I'll go down and get in the mouth of them prophets and make them prophesy a lie. You say, well, now, brother, how can a man tell whether he's wrong? Why? Micah's vision was according to the Word. The Word of God had already been spoken by by the prophet, and the Word of the Lord always comes to the prophet. And if the prophet Elijah had cursed Ahab and told him that the dogs would lick his blood, then how could he... Bless what God had cursed. Amen. So his vision was according to the word. Man. A man wrote me a letter the other day. He said he's in deliverance ministry. He said, how can you tell whether it's the God speaking to you or, or the devil? <laughs> I said, examine it by the word. Amen. If it's not with the word, then it's wrong. I don't Amen. care how good it looks. Yes. In the Old Testament, they had a way to find out when a prophet was telling the truth. Or a dreamer was dreaming right. They took him down to the temple and put him before the Urim Thundam. And if that Urim Thundam acted and no glamoration of lights like a rainbow flashing off of that, God was recognizing that prophet to be truth or the prophecy or the dreamer. But if it did not, no matter how real it seemed, it was wrong. It always yeah. answered God did in supernatural. Yeah. I'll tell you, that priesthood ended and that Urim Thundam left it. But we got a new one today, and that's this Bible. If a yeah. preacher or anybody else preaches any dumb or anything outside of that Bible, to me it's Amen. wrong. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Books, it's got to be wrong. It's got to line up with that Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Don't mix nothing with it. Just leave it the way it is. That's the way God has it, and that's the way we must accept it and believe it. Yes, the blind man. Sure, he couldn't argue theology with him, but he was persistent. He knew that once he was blind, then he could see. Sure, he knew that one thing. He was very persistent. They said his father and mother, they said, if anybody confesses this prophet of Galilee, we'll put him out of the church. And so this boy got a hold of something. Something had happened to him. 
And he was persistent. He could tell him. He couldn't. He said, it's a strange thing to me now that here's something that only God could do and hasn't happened in none of our churches down through the ages that I know of. A man born blind receives his sight and you're supposed to be the leaders of the people of this day and yet you don't know from whence he comes. It's a strange thing, yeah. brother. He had some real good arguing points there. <laughs> I would think. Yes, sir. People say today, what is all this about? And don't know, theologians and so forth, that the Bible predicts this very thing to happen. Yeah. Amen. Oh, brother, how persistent we ought to be. Philip, when he stood there and heard Jesus speak to Simon and call him Simon, said, your name is Simon. You're the son of Jonas. And never seen him before. He was very persistent. He got a hold of Nathaniel. And when Nathaniel came, he said, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no God. He said, When did you know me, Rabbi? He said, Before Philip called you, when he was under the tree, I saw you. He got real persistent. He said, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. The little woman at the well, she'd been looking for a Messiah to come. She'd heard all the theologians and back and forth, and she thought she might as well walk the street and be a prostitute, if that's the best they had. And she, one day she come down to the well to get some water. There sat an ordinary man looking about 50 years old, I suppose. And she looked at him, and he asked her to bring him a drink. And she went into the customs and said this segregation and so forth. But when he said, go get your husband and come here, she said, I have none. He said, you've said truth, you've had five, and the one you have now is not your husband. She said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Yes. We know when the Messiah cometh, these things will be what he'll do. Yes. He said, I'm he that speaks to you. Now, she wasn't, according to law, supposed to tell men in the marketplaces anything because she's the ill-famed woman. But, brother, she was persistent, and she persuaded them. Amen. Her perseverance until she said, Come see a man. Amen. Don't sit there. Don't sit there. Come see a man. God shall raise up a top of my own Amen. Him. She was persistent until she got the man out there and they believed on it. Reminds me of a little story we had down in Mexico where the Christian businessman's voice had an article of it here not long ago. We went down there and the General Valdina was the one who had me down there. And so they got in a little trouble about the Mexican government bringing in a Protestant and so by this military force. And so the bishop went over and said, Sir, he said, uh, you know this man's not a Catholic? He said, No, but said, I guess he's a reputable person. Thousands come to hear him preach, they say. He said, Oh, it's just the ignorant and unlearned that goes out to hear a person like that. He said, You've had him down here for 500 years. Why the ignorant and unlearned? <laughs> guess that was a good shut up. <laughs> and so they let us have a place out there and thousands gathered in. And I was to be there about three nights. One night on the platform, I looked and here come a poor old Mexican brother, blind as he could be, his feet bare and calloused all over, his old hat and his hands soaked with cords, his trouser legs tore off up there. I looked at him dusty all over. He's coming along there, holding his hat in his hand. He's mumming off something to the man that was bringing him. When he got close to me, he reached down his pocket and got out a little crucifix and began to, to say a, a Hail Mary. And I had him to put it up. And so he come up there and I looked at him. I thought, here he is. Poor old fellow. Probably never had a decent meal in his life. There he is now, looking not even shoes on. Here I stand with a good pair of shoes. Here I stand with a suit. I believe it's the same suit that Brother Carl Williams, his wife, gave me. There and I, and I was standing there and I thought, here I got a suit on. I thought, I put my shoulders, I thought if it would fit him, I'd sure give it to him. I put my feet inside of his, it wouldn't fit him at all. I thought, what could I do? And I thought, there he is, staggering in blindness. Poor old fella. You've got to feel for the people or you don't do no good to pray for him. That's all. And I thought if my daddy would have lived, he'd have been about that age. I put my arms around him and started to hug him like that. And I said, Lord Jesus, there's nothing can help him but you. He hasn't got a penny of money and probably never had a good meal or a decent suit of clothes on in his life and here he stands and nature has been so cruel to him to hear he's blind look what fate has done for him oh lord god have mercy on him Lord, glory adios and look around the old man could see as good as i could there he went up the rejoicing hollering 
The next night there's a whole pile of old shawls and coats piled up that high across the platform, raining. Now, them people didn't come and argue because I stayed until 9 o'clock. I didn't get there till 9 o'clock. And they come there at 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning and leaned against one another. Just leaned against one No place to sit down. Just stood in this big ring and leaned against one another. So when I got on the platform, got started uh, speaking about faith, looking over this big pile of old shawls, how they ever know who they belong to, and hats and coats and so forth. I looked all down through there. And Billy come to me and said, Daddy, we've got a hundred or more ushers standing down there. And there's a woman got a dead baby standing there. And said, we, they, we ain't got enough ushers to hold that woman out of the line. Well, I said, what size is she? And he said, well, she's just a little bitty thing. And I said, but she's been standing here all day with that dead baby. And Brother Jack Moore, many of you know him. He was standing behind me. I said, Brother Jack, Brother Espinosa. Many of you Spanish-speaking people know Brother Espinosa. And he said, he was interpreting for me. Now I said, Brother Moore, go over there. She don't know me. Go over there and pray for her. And she'd go through them little ushers there. She'd run under her feet, climb over the top of her back, holding a dead baby in her arm. A little Catholic woman. And she was trying to get up there. What? Faith cometh by hearing. She'd heard that cry and then received his sight. She knew that that was God. It was God for the living. God for the the dead. It was the same God for the living. Amen. 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 No matter what Amen. Amen. she was. Amen. That's it. Amen. She knew he was God. Yes. And she was trying to get up there. And so Brother Moore started over to pray for the baby. And I turned around and began to say, and as I was saying, Brother Espinosa interpreted, faith is a substance. And I looked in here in front of me was a little Mexican baby, little dark face and little gums a shining, little bitty fella, just smiling, sitting right here in front of me. I thought, that must be that baby. And I looked around and Brother Moore was trying to get down through the ushers. I said, just a minute, Brother Moore. Uh, uh, car back ushers. The reason she couldn't come up, she didn't have a prayer card. Brother, I call him manana, which means tomorrow. He was so slow, he'd just get down there and stand around and give the prayer cards out. And Billy went out to watch him, seeing he didn't sell any of them. So he didn't see he got by. So he couldn't speak Spanish, so he, he'd give out all the prayer cards he didn't have anymore. And she's going to get through anyhow. She is persistent. She wanted that thing yes. done. And so Brother Moore started back that way. And, and I said, wait a minute, Brother Moore. He said, what's the matter? I said, I don't know. Don't interpret, Brother Espinosa. I said, I see a little Mexican baby standing looking right at me, right out of the Oh, the audience right here. I said, let her come over here. And so they never interpret that. And the little mother come walking up there, a beautiful little woman about, oh, I'd say about 25 years old, just as wet as she could be in her pretty hair hanging down her face and her eyes scorched with tears and how uh, the streaks down her face. And she run up there and she fell down on the floor and began to holler, Padre, I think it means father, best Padres and uh, Padre, ever, like that. And, uh, and I said, stand up, stand up. And Brother Espinosa's come over. I said, when did the baby die? She said, nine this morning. And that was about 1030 that night. And just as wet as the little blanket laying over like that, she had the little form holding out like this. I said, just hold still, just a minute. And, um, and so she stood. And I said, Heavenly Father, I seen in vision a little Mexican baby. I do not know if it's this baby or not, but to calm the heart of this mother. And that could have been a vision from you. That's the reason I'm here. I lay my hands up on the little baby and went, Wah! We're going to kick his little feet like that. There it was alive! Wow! It was a woman! Brother Espinosa may be sitting present tonight. There's many, is that right? Is Brother Espinosa in here? He's, all of you know him and you, can, you know the story. What was it? That little woman, persistent. Oh, she knew if God could open the eyes of that blind man, he could also heal her baby, bring it back to life. And so I said to Brother Espinosa, don't you say nothing about that. Don't you do that now, because the only thing I seen was just the baby there. I don't know what it means. You send a runner with a woman and go to the doctor and get a statement that that baby died and he pronounced it dead. Brother Espinosa sent a runner with her and went the next day to the doctor. The doctor said, I pronounced the baby dead yesterday morning. It died with pneumonia or something like that at 9 o'clock. The baby was dead. And now it's alive. Yeah. Ah! That faith! Faith call a hold of something. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh, Hallelujah. You've got to be persistent, persevering. 
got to know that God is still God and God always was God. God will always be God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Take a hold of it by faith and be perseverant. Don't turn it loose. God promised it. It's up to God to make it right. God made the promise. God will do it. Let us bow our heads just a moment. I won't finish this up till some other time because it, it's, I uh, happen to notice it's getting a little late. Persistent. Perseverance. Tomorrow afternoon, I'll put the whole afternoon praying for the people with them prayer cards. I just feel like that the Holy Ghost is here and you've got enough faith to move it. Do you believe that? Raise up your hands if you believe it. All right. I take that to bring down the Spirit. I do not see one person that I know in this audience. This woman testified just now when they're raised up and sealed with a large tumor. And if I'm not mistaken, I want to ask this last night, isn't this Sister Upshaw? God bless you, Sister Upshaw. Her husband, you all remember, Brother Willie Upshaw, is at your place that night. An invalid for 60-something years in a wheelchair, God healed him. He was healed until he went to be with Jesus years later. Outside of that, that's all that I know. But you have a need of God. Now, let's just stop. Just take a minute and study for a minute. Now, how many of you there know that Jesus, when he was here on earth, when he came, he was the Messiah of God, the anointed one. You believe it? How did the people know he was the anointed one? Because he did the sign of the Messiah. Yeah. Now, they hadn't had a prophet for 400 years. And Israel always pleased their prophets. The Bible says, If there be one among you who is spiritual or prophet, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him and speak to him in visions and so forth. And if what he says comes to pass, then you hear him. But if it doesn't come to pass, then don't fear that prophet, because I haven't spoke to him. Well, that's just only sense, see, that it would be. Now, the Messiah, according to the Bible, was to be a prophet, a God prophet. Moses said, the Lord your God shall raise up a prophet in Deuteronomy, liken unto me. And when he come, how did they recognize him to be a prophet? Because he foretold things that was exactly right. He knew the thoughts that were in their heart. He told them who they were, what they were. What their needs was, what they'd done. Is that right? Yes. And they know that was a sign of the Messiah. Yes. Philip said, Thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Yes. When he told him about him, the miracle was performed on him. Now, in St. John, the 14th chapter and 12th verse, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he also. Amen. Now, if I told you tonight, let me show you about the weakness of the church. We claim to be Christians. If I said the spirit of John Billinger to me, I'd have guns and I'd be an alcohol. Oh, that's in the nature. Yes. If I said the spirit, if you put the life of a, of a pumpkin vine in a grapevine, it'll bear pumpkin. Yes. Sure. It's a life, is it? It produces. Put the life out of an apple tree into a pear tree, it'll bear apples. Because the life of the apple tree is in it. Put the life of Christ in an individual, it'll bear the fruits of Christ Amen. and the life of Christ. That's when you said, you Shall he do also? Amen. Now look, oh, did he ever organize a school, a seminary? <laughs> works that I do. He said, if you don't believe me, believe the works that I do. They yeah. testify me. Yeah. Yes. Sir. What works Let's testify to me? Look at that little woman up there. She said, I know when Messiah cometh, he'll do these things. But who art thou? He said, I'm he. She yeah. went in and said, isn't this the very Messiah? Isn't that what the Messiah is supposed to do? Come see a man who told me the things that I've done. Yeah. See? Well, if Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he is the same. Yeah, he is. Now, the only thing is the carpal body. Yet, a little while in the world, cosmos, the order of the world, will see me no more. Yet, ye shall see me, the church, the believer, for I, and I is a personal pronoun. Yeah. I'll be with you. Even in you, to the end of the world. Amen. I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Jesus Christ is saying, yesterday, today, forever. 
that if the Spirit of Christ is in us, He'll do the works of Christ. Yes, He will. That's what my faith says. Praise the Lord. You know I'm a preacher. Uh, I have no education. I can't preach. I don't claim to be. But my preaching is by gift. Confirmation of what preachers preach about. Yes. My ignorance. I guess God just let me raise up like that. But know my heart. That I love people and love God. I want to do something. And if I don't love you, then I don't love God. Amen. The only way I can serve God is serving you. Yes. To serve one another. In so much as you've done for these things. Lord, you've done it to me. What business do I have out here tonight? Why, why in my home? Why up in the hills with my fishing pole somewhere? Down here for a deceiver and go to meet God out under judgment? Not me. I'll go fish and go hunting first and meet God in peace. Stand here with a deceiver. It ain't popularity. You know, I shun that. I don't have no big programs and beg people for money and, and all this kind of stuff. I never took offering in my life. I keep my meeting where I can go to wherever God sends me. If it's no matter if it's ten buck two or wherever it is, if He wants me to preach to five hundred thousand like in Bombay. He sends me over there. Somebody else sponsors it. If I want to go down here where it's just four or five people, I don't have to have any money. I want to be where God can use me. And every one of us can be where God can use us. See? Yes, Lord. Oh, now He's God. If he is the same God today that he always was, that he never was God. That's right. Amen. And the Bible says that he is a high priest. Amen. Jesus. Amen. 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 How do you do? And he can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Amen. Amen. A high priest, living, ever living, to make intercession for us. And can be touched by the feeling of our infirmity. Now, this is Karen said to me. Hundreds of others to testify the same thing. Now, you know I'm on the side. I'm the brother. Listen to my Lord. I was a Baptist preacher. Coming among you people. Because the Baptist would receive it. And they told me I was off of my mind. But I know if God said it, there's somebody somewhere to receive it. Yes, that's right. Amen. So that's why I'm here. Hallelujah. Now, it's just a gift. If God will just put me in that position, I'm just his mouthpiece. Now, these men are sound. They've got training. They know how to put it together. I just had to splatter it out there anyway. Just by inspiration. But they know how to set it together and make sense out of it. But I just have to reach up and get it and throw it and reach and get it and throw it. That's what we have to do. But in this a gift, if God will grant it, that he takes in moves and speaks to you. Yes. Just the same happens. The woman touches his garment, and if he's the same high priest, the same yesterday and forever, he'll act the same. Hey. He's the same high priest. You believe that? Yes. Amen. I have faith in God. Amen. Don't doubt it. But just believe. I want to know, along here, you people that's sick, anywhere in the building, wherever you may be, and knows that I don't know one thing about you, just raise up your hand. No, it's just solid. Now, you pray. You do this. Now, this is promised. If I had time to take you back to where Jesus said like it was in the days of, of Sodom, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Do you notice what kind of a church that angel set by when he had his back turned to the audience like or back to the tent and he said, why did Sarah laugh in the tent? Now, Jesus predicts right there that that thing will happen again. Yeah. It, God vindicated himself that way to the Jews, to the Samaritans, but not to the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles wasn't looking for no Messiah. The day we're looking for a Messiah, and the way he did it back there, God is God. He can never make a decision and then change and say, I'll do something else. And if he lets the church go in just on theology, without showing himself visible among them like that, then he's doing something for them back there he didn't do for us. Yeah. But he promised to do it. That's Amen. what I believe, and that's what he proves. Now, have faith in God. Amen. Be persistent. Say, Lord Jesus, that little old bald-headed preacher standing there don't know nothing about me. But you do. Lord Jesus, without being nervous, all pressured up, I come humbly. I confess every sin that I've ever done. I love you, Lord. 
Let me touch you, will you, Lord? I need you. Then you use his lips. If he's told me the truth, then I believe he has. Use his lips and speak back, Heavenly Father, and let me know. Speak to me like you did the woman that had the blood issue. I'll believe you. Will you do that? Would it make you persistent then that you hold right on? All right. Let us pray. Now, Heavenly Father, the meeting is yours. I cannot make myself. I only ask, Lord, I don't even ask you to do it, but if it be in your divine will, in your order, let it come to pass. No matter what I would say, one word from you will mean more than all of us could say, Lord, in a lifetime. Just one word from you. Now, I have tried through these 31 years of preaching to hold your name, to speak of you. And now, Father, thou has never let me down at any time, and I don't believe you will tonight. So I pray that you'll give us something, Lord, that the people might go home, the strangers with us, and say, truly, Jesus Christ is not dead. He's alive. Because I've seen him working through human beings tonight, doing the same work, so it must be the same life. Then they'll hunger for you, Lord, and come and confess you as their Savior. Granted, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Pulling back here. Just don't pray. Just pray for me. Let it be out here. Our time will be tomorrow. Set right in quick. I like that. Or you don't know how I feel. By the way, have you bought your picture of it yet? How many ever seen the picture of that angel of the Lord? They put it back there. And you can get it. It was taken over here in Washington, D.C., in the religion hall of art. Only supernatural being ever photographed, a pillar of fire. Yeah. Years ago, when a little boy, when I was baptizing down on the river that day, just my first message in a missionary Baptist church, I was baptizing 500. And that afternoon on June 1933, on June about the 15th, here come that pillar of fire rolling out of the sky. It's like a pretty sunshine afternoon roll right down there. The voice shook the whole country around there. Said it's John the Baptist. Forerun the first coming of Christ, your message will forerun the second coming. Yes. And that started the revival immediately after that. And there it went across the nation, around the world, Pentecost reviving. And that's what has taken place, the second coming of Christ. And now the newspapers packed it way up in Canada. It was on articles and so forth and went on Associated Press. I kept telling people, then finally, the eye of the camera began to catch it. And now they've got it back there. Now, how many know that that pillar of fire was Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. Sure. Now, look, when the show heard and said, I come from God and I go to God. Is that right? I come from God, I go to God. As his death, burial, and resurrection, Paul, Saul, then was on his road down to Damascus to rest some people that were making too much noise, shouting and going on. So he is on his road down, and that pillar of fire come down before him. The people didn't see it. He saw it. Them with him didn't see it. But a pillar of fire that struck him down blind, and he fell to the ground. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. He comes from God, and he returns back to God. And when that pillar of fire, the Spirit, was in a man's body called Jesus Christ, performed those miracles, and he's the same yesterday ever. And here it is, the scientific world proves, like George J. Lacey, the head of the FBI, that examined the print, and you know it, there's his right up right with it like that. He said, I've been your critic, Mr. Brandon, but said the mechanical eye of this camera won't take psychology. Yes. Because the light struck the lens. Amen. Now, that if that spirit don't bear the same record that Jesus Christ bears, then it isn't the same spirit. Amen. But if it does, it's him among us. Yeah. Do you believe All right. All right. All right. Thank you, Jesus. Pray. Praise somebody in this district over here. Oh, Just pray in the Lord. Bless you. Bless you. I think every spirit in here under my control in the name of Jesus Christ for the glory of God. Set still now. These diseases will go from one to the other. Yes. They're here. Did you see that? 
You'll be well. You believe it? You see what he is? Amen. Now the two or three witnesses let him work me in the staff. Here. Look at there. Look at that woman. There's a head step woman sitting there. She's got the, an ulcer, bleeding ulcer, on her leg. It's on her leg, lady. and she was standing there praying, Lord Jesus, let it be me. If that's right, I'm going to take it to the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't know the woman, she's a stranger, if that's right, wave your hand. Hallelujah. How would I know what she's praying about? The same God that can hear it, and can answer it. Amen. 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 What about this woman sitting Jesus. here with a green dress on? You believe me to be God's prophet? We're strangers to one another, are we? If God will tell me what your desire is, will you believe it? You're seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If that's right, raise up your hand. Receive the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Believe in the Word of God. Are you ready to believe? Here, here it is. This man thinks this is the future. Sir, I'm going to give you. I just can't do it. But the life is over here just a few months ago. Continue to pray. Lady sitting here, right here in front of me. She just had an operation, complete hysterectomy, female glands. It hasn't done well. It's bad. You believe that God can heal you? You believe me to be his prophet or his servant? You do? You believe that God knows who you are? If he'll let me call your name, Mrs. Cole, you believe with all your heart. Amen. You live at 7 years back on East Maple Street, Glendale. Go home and believe in Jesus Christ. Get you right. Amen. By the way, that's your mother sitting right behind you. And she's suffering. That thrill was supposed to see her daughter heal. You, you have a lump in your abdomen here. You're bringing out that you do with all your heart. Then you should
Let in Jesus' name.